Jones steps up. Ricketts is at the high point. Jones. Aromaterio has a lane. Nicholas Aromaterio, the shot. Scores! Holy jumping! The Italian Stallion puts the puck in the back of the net. Mamma mia, Nicholas Aromaterio! So the chief it even does. Callum Jones reports at the blue light kept in by the skate of Thomas Maya. Maya. Down low on the half course, he swings out of the slot for Potts. Kyle Potts has it, hangs on, now he shoots, scores! Holy jumping! How do you do? Kyle Potts puts the puck in the back of the net. Blocked that shot, and coming the other way is Alton McDermott, he's in on the breakaway, scores! Holy jumping! His grandfather, Paul Henderson, must be ecstatic about that one because Alton McDermott just scored his first career Buckland Cup final playoff goal has been pulled. The Dukes are in the Oakville zone. Zone Elvis swung that around. The Blades are trying to tie this puck up. It goes into the corner. The Blades have a chance to get this out. Elvis will tie it up. Ten seconds. Gilmore has it at the point. It's in. Tips just wide. Seven seconds. It's back in the corner. Ewing's blocking. Three, two, one. The Oakville Blades. Oh! You're watching Mamma Mia! This is Fire Talk with Nicholas Fiore. Welcome back, everybody, to episode number 28 of Mamma Mia! This is Fire Talk. I'm Nicholas Fiore, the Oakville Blades play by play broadcaster, and joining me on this edition of the show is former NHLer for seven years, Jim Thompson. Jim, thanks for uh, joining. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, Nick. Look forward to it. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, obviously you're, you're a big guy in hockey. You're just not a former NHL player. You know, you're doing other stuff as well. Um, currently the governor of the Aurora Tigers um, of the Ontario Junior Hockey League, the same league, obviously, that I'm in with the Oakville Blades. Um, president as well as Jim Thompson's Dreams. Um, life coach, NHL ambassador for King Heights Academy in Thornhill. So you have you have a lot, a lot, a lot going on. Um, how do you manage to just, just you know, obviously COVID might be halted a little bit, but how do you manage to keep everything going and together? And I got to be there. I got to be there. I got to be there. Uh, you you got to balance it. So each, you know, um, I'll refer to Gretzky and playing with Wayne, thinking of play ahead right on the ice you learn to think to play ahead in life. And, uh, you know, with all these things moving parts, Nick, I have to pre-plan. I got to schedule my time and I can't overbook. I can't double book. And, you know, I, I do a good job balancing it all and, and getting it all in. And, you know, I have good people work with me. So, you know, the hockey team in Aurora, I got, you know, uh, Dermot Anderson, I got Jimmy Wells, Greg Johnson, former Boston Bruins. So I got some really good people that run the hockey team, which leave me to do other things. And uh, that's, you know, always surround yourself with good people. So that's how I do it. Absolutely. And obviously it must be a lot, but like you said, right, you've got to have plans and you've you got to have stuff uh, in place in order to be successful and, and work everything out. Um, first of all, how, how have you been during COVID? I, have, have you been home or what, what's been going on? Yeah, so I've been fortunate. I work out of my home. Uh, this is my home office here. Um, I've been very busy. Uh, part of my mentoring, we'll call it, I do a lot of interventions. I work with a lot of people with problems. So through COVID, I've been very busy, Nick, sadly. Um, the good part is I'm helping a lot of people and taking a lot of people to rehab. And uh, it's it's a trying time. And so... You know, I, I've been busy and, um, you know, we, we need to get out of this COVID. We need to get the vaccine into us and we need to get back to reality. And, and there's going to be a lot of people who don't want to take the vaccine or don't believe in COVID or do believe in COVID. So it's, it's just a whole, a whole mess. That hopefully we, we, we get out. Uh, so I'm glad you're doing okay and, and you're, still, you're still helping out, which is uh, not what many people are doing during this time, right? So that's very good to hear. Let's talk about, um, we're going to get into a lot of stuff, but let's talk about like your NHL experience first. Obviously, uh, you, play, you did play seven years um, with Washington, Hartford, New Jersey, LA Kings, Ottawa, as well as Anaheim ending off there. 
seven years. Um, what, what, what would you say your overall experience is? We're going to get to uh, playing with Mr. Wayne and some other stuff, but your overall experience wrapped up for your, your NHL time. So I tell all the kids that I work with, and it's the best way to put it into one is the journey to get to the NHL was not work. And it was passion, shooting pucks, running hills, lifting weights, you know, skating, training. That was all very passionate for me. Um, getting Once you got there, it was work because there's six guys waiting to take your job. So what I found out, you know, once I finally made it was it's very difficult to get there. It's very difficult to stay. The experience is second to none. You know, my office is basically a museum of my career. And uh, when I look around and, and, and realize that I actually made it, I'm a, I'm a hockey geek. So I love, you know, your owner, Jamie Storr, and I were a short time in L.A. together. Um, you know, Jamie came and spoke at my camp this summer. So I'm a real hockey fan. And I tell my wife this, you know, when I see an NHL player, if I don't know him, I, I'm, in, I'm in, admired, right? Because that's every young hockey player's dream is to play in the NHL. So even though I played, I'm, you know, I'm a fan. Like, I'm like, wow, pleasure to meet you. And, and, and it's sincere because, you know, I just love the game of hockey. And uh, But the whole scope of my tenure from the minors to pro in the NHL, my 10 years, amazing experience. I tell stories for 10 years, you know, the stories that you have and amazing. It's just amazing dream. And that's why I named my company dreams do come true is partly for, because of Don Cherry, but the, the dream is unbelievable. And the dream must have been, you know, unbelievable basically. And, and you having such a, so many stories, but there was a time where you, know, you took off, you, you finished your NHL career in 1994, 93, 94 with Anaheim. And it looks like you took a bit of a break, right? And obviously we're going through some things. What, what made you find the passion to get back into the game um, coaching with Toronto Canada Moose and then obviously coming to Aurora and, and what, what made you find it? Cause you were off a little bit. Uh, and then, okay. I do. I got to get back into this. I just love the game too much. Yeah. So I went through some difficult times post career. Uh, I, I, you know, call it a black hole, um, drug addiction, alcoholism. Um, you know, I was, I was, I'm lucky to be here today. Um, and I went to the NHL rehab. Straighten my life out. I'm 12 years sober this year. I'm in my 13th year, which is, you know, obviously turned, thank you, turned my life around. But I, what's interesting is when I went through this difficult time, I got into NASCAR racing where I was driving a, a driver around to the NASCAR tracks promoting a, an energy product. So I just kind of needed, you know, to just separate myself from that old life. And I just you know, driving this big Winnebago around the United States from track to track was a lot of fun. I'm a huge race fan. And then what happened was, you know, hockey obviously being, you know, that was my life. Then I had an opportunity to come back into it. As you said, I coached the Toronto Moose and the GMHL and coached minor hockey and uh, had boys that played. And then, you know, one thing led to another. And, you know, I just celebrated my 21st year of training uh, and mentoring hockey players, which is called JT Prospects. And my wife and I purchased the uh, Roar Tiger six years ago. And, uh, you know, I'm full-fledged back into hockey and couldn't be happier. Absolutely. And, and like I said, congratulations. Or congratulations. And, you know, on being sober and all that, because now you can, as you are, passing your your knowledge and your and your – tough times and experience to other people that may need it, um, which is great you went through it, but, you know, a former NHL player, like all these, all these people that, you know, maybe will look up to you and take that advice. So congratulations. Thank you. And you know what, you, you, you bring up a great point there. A lot of my, you know, people that I'm helping, a lot of young people, a lot of hockey players, a lot of, you know, hockey fans. So when I get with the person that's having issues, the fact that I did play in the NHL, they whether they look up to it or admire it, like I was saying I do, it does help them listening and engaging to my story of how they can beat this addiction. So, yeah, you, I'm glad that you said that. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's the first thing that came to my mind. Of course, that's amazing. Um, let's let's move on a little bit here. Uh, to play, play with Mr. Gretzky. Not a lot of people can, can do that. He was basically on – 
two teams, I guess, you know, is his whole, his whole career for the most part anyways. Um, but you also played with Luke Robitaille, Rob Blake, Paul Coffey in the time in L.A. specifically, and you played, I'm sure, with players, many of the teams. But playing with Wayne Gretzky, it, 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 in the day, Wayne Gretzky, I feel like everyone knows Wayne Gretzky, and, and he's one of the best players. Um, but, you know, what, uh, what can you say that, you know, the experience you did play with Wayne Gretzky and, and, and how special was it to play with him? Well, we'll start this. I, I, was, uh, I, had, I was a free agent out of New Jersey. I grew up in Edmonton. So Wayne's a few years older than I am. So I was in my last year midget when he came to Edmonton, um, I believe, and then playing junior hockey, they were winning Stanley Cups in Edmonton. So I, I had four teams interested in me. Uh, I was a free agent, as I said, and I agreed to a contract with Detroit. And they weren't very tough at the time. I was a physical player. So my agent said this would be a great fit. So we agreed to a contract. The next day, he called me back and said, L.A. just matched Detroit's contract, but it's not a good fit. They had Jay Miller, Marty McSorley, Jeff Chicken, a whole bunch of physical players. He said, so you got to sign in Detroit. And I said, no. His name was Steve Bartlett, my agent. I said, Steve. I said, Wayne Gretzky's my idol. I said, I will find a way. I want to go to L.A. He, he's talking. He's like, you're going to end up playing in New Haven. You're going to go to the minors. They're not. I can see how this is going down. I said, I will gamble. I will gamble on this. And so he was dead against it. I signed in uh, LA. Sure enough, went to New Haven, but did my thing, got called up. My very first game uh, was in Chicago. I fought Stu Grimson and Mike Peluso. I ended up getting uh, the game winner. Um, so two different games, but this was through that tenure of, uh, you know, got the game winner in Chicago, a uh, tough place to play. So that was the start of this whole, you know, playing with my idol and, and, and being, you know, protecting him in a sense. So I always say this about Wayne, Nick, he's a better father and a better person than he was a hockey player. And what he was special for is he'd come in to the room and he would make guys like me who are fourth liners feel as important as Yerry Curry or Paul Coffey. He just made everybody feel equal, which was, you can't say that about all hockey players or all people. So that always stuck with me about treat everybody fairly, but just a wonderful man. Um, I got to go to the Stanley Cup final with him, and, you know, um, he's just an unbelievable person. That's great to hear. And like you said, you know, not everyone, let's be honest, in, in hockey, but in sports in general is like that, right? Not everyone is uh, all all up there and, and, you know, all welcoming. But to hear, you know, maybe the best player to ever play the game of hockey was like that, it is something special for sure. Well, he was the best player to ever play yeah, the game. there you go. <laughs> his, his, records, his records, you know, 215 points, I don't 92 goals, 50, 50 goals in 39 games. These are records that probably will never be beat. But, you know, his, his points, his history speaks for itself. But – you know, I played with a lot of players over my – I've met a lot of athletes. You know, we shared a dressing room with the L.A. Lakers. Magic Johnson was an unbelievable, you know, person, mentor. Like, just these are great people. But, you know, Wayne, Wayne, uh, I say it, he's a better person than he was a hockey player. He's, he's a really caring individual. That's fantastic to hear. Um, moving on with, you know, playing in the NHL. It, it's everyone – you know, every little hockey player's dream kind of to play in the big leagues, right, to play in the NHL. And, and no matter what, you still did that. You had the opportunity and you played 115 games in the NHL. Um, but it's not always so easy, right? It's, you're not always going to be the Wayne Gretzky's and the Coffees and the McDavid's and Matthews and going to be there 24-7. Sometimes other guys have to put in extra work to get into um, the big leagues permanently. And previously, on a previous episode, I spoke to Mike Zygomanis, Um was a former NHLer as well, and he was in the same boat on not always being up in the big leagues. How tough was it for you at the time you were playing, or how difficult is it to be a full-time NHLer? In my case, it was very difficult because, you know, in the minors, I fought a lot. Washington told me one year, if you want to make our team, you got to fight. So I had 41, ga 41 fights that year, led wow. the league in penalty minutes. I didn't like fighting. So imagine that. It's something that you don't like. And now they're asking you to do this. Well, to play in the NHL, I would have done anything. 
So that's when I started to really not like hockey. I love the life. I love the practices. I love going to the rink. But now you're going out every game, bare knuckle fighting with six, six monsters, you know, and um, it's very difficult. So, you know, for a guy like me who had to survive on being smart and not getting knocked out, not getting my, you know, my ass kicked in a sense <laughs> just to survive. Yeah. I, it was it tax it was very taxing mentally a lot of stress a lot of anxiety um you know and that's why I came out years ago and said that this role was killing the enforcer because um you look at all the enforcers who have either committed suicide or passed away through addiction whatever the case may be you don't see any goal scorers in there and uh you know it was a tough tough life so to answer your question Nick I was always looking over my shoulder for the next guy to take my job. And that's why when I said earlier, making it was not hard. It was passionate to get there. Staying there was very difficult because we weren't Luke Robitaille scoring 50 goals a year and, and having a secure position. Right. Yeah. And it's as simple as that. So that means in your opinion, um, without putting any words in your mouth, of course, in your opinion, you think fighting should still be in the game today? No, I, I said this years ago, and I don't know if you remember, but Don Cherry came out on Hockey Night in Canada and called me a puke, a turncoat, and a hypocrite. Yes. And it was me who said it. I said all this, and he involved Stu Grimson and Chris Nyland innocently. They didn't say a word. So two weeks later, he apologized. But why do we need it? You just watch the World Juniors, beautiful hockey. There wasn't one fight. You watch the NHL playoffs. Like the speed, the the you know, and I'll say this to you, I don't want to see a young kid bleeding all over the ice, being knocked out, potentially hitting his head. There's no good in it. Yeah, you know what? I always say this now. If you want to watch a fight, watch UFC. You know, watch yep. that. That's that's fighting. There's fighting, but hockey doesn't need it. And I and I and I what I would do is like every other sport. If you fight, you're kicked out. You know, none of this. You know, I used to have three fights a game. Five minutes, go. Five minutes, go. And the third one, you get kicked out. But one fight, you're out. Just like baseball, basketball, or football, right? And then I'm okay with it. You want to fight? You know, and then guys won't be uh, achieving their bonuses. And, you know, there's a lot to think about, right? In the business end of the game. But there's no need for it. Yeah. There's no need for it. Absolutely. And, and obviously, and that's been a conversation for, for plenty of years now. And I, I do, as a, as a diehard hockey fan, Leafs fan specifically, I do think – there's been less and I do think there's been more skill, but it's still there. Right. And, and it's like, they're saying, well, how are you going to protect a Matthews or a Marner type of case? Well, you know, there, I'm sure there's ways around it by implementing maybe different rules. That's probably a whole nother conversation for a whole other time. But you know, you know what the new enforcer is? What? There's a thousand camera angles in an arena. And if somebody does something to Matthews or Marner or McDavid, they, they, they're not getting away with it. No. Okay. No. And, and if there's something illegally done where an enforcer has to come out and kick somebody's rear end, well, just suspend them. Yeah. If you want to break the rules, just suspend the player. So, you know, it, there is ways around it. Pardon? There is ways around it, I believe. For of course sure. there is. But to have, you know, I don't have a problem with two guys pushing in the corner and, and, you know, uh, their tempers are up and, and, dropping their gloves and fighting. There's no problem with that. Yeah. Just they fight, they're out. Yep. I couldn't, and I, and I, I couldn't. No different than our league. It's no yeah. different than our league. You want to fight? Yeah. Right? You want to fight and get kicked out? Go for it. Do you know how many fights we had last year? Zero. Zero. Yeah. Zero. The year before, one. Yeah. You know, and why Why would you want to fight? No, I, I would, hey, I wouldn't want to fight. That's for, that's for sure, right? It's true, and I agree with you. Um, let's Let's change gears a little bit other than, the NHL, obviously, now to our league, the Ontario Junior Hockey League. As you said, you, your, your wife and yourself purchased the Aurora Tigers six years ago. Um, you were the president from 2015 to 2018, three seasons, now the governor. Um, why, why Aurora? Why, why purchase them? And I guess a follow-up to it, why uh, just the governor now, just maybe overseeing things rather than being the president? Um, we live in Aurora. And we almost purchased the team in the CCHL, Canada Lasers. Yes. And thankfully it fell through. And then I, uh, 
uh, a guy that I know who owned Aurora, his kid played on the team and then his kid left. So I reached out to him and I said, listen, I'm looking at buying a team. And he wasn't interested. And two weeks later, he called me back and said, you know what? I'll sell it to you. So instead of being five and a half hours away in Canada, I'm five minutes away from the rink. So it, it was a blessing that we got Aurora. Obviously a long history. The only team in the OJHL to win two national championships. So, you know, it's been here. We celebrated, I think our third year was our 50 year anniversary of the Aurora Tigers. And uh, re regarding president, the governor, I just, you know, I, I, I feel I'm in the same seat. I hire a staff. I, you know, being a hockey guy, I always want to be involved. And, you know, people think because I, you know, I've gone through some coaches and all that and for, for reasons that I, you know, things don't work out. You hire somebody. So I really have my thumb on my hockey team. I'm involved um, and maybe too involved for some people's liking, but, you know, I'm a passionate hockey guy and, you know, it's, 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 I'm a, I'm, I, I say it this way. If I get along with you, I'm easy to work for. If there's head butting and we've got different philosophy then I'm, you know, then it's not going to work. Absolutely. And that's just the bottom, that's the bottom line in life. If, if you're not, if you can't work with your employees or you can't work with your boss, you, normally it doesn't last. Absolutely. Um, well, if, if anyone, for everyone who doesn't know, what would the governor role entail, maybe just in general in hockey, but in, uh, in the OJHL specifically? So what that means is, you know, we have, uh, it's been a lot, everything by Zoom since COVID come. So I go to the governor meetings and sit with the other 21 governors. Um, and we decide on what we want to change and, you know, all the things that are going on in the league and that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, when I was uh, president, I was, you know, more hands-on with the hockey team in a sense. But, you know, I really have a good staff right now and I allow them to do their thing. You know, we, we've had great years here um, and we've had last year we won seven games and it was a young team. We knew we were going to struggle. And that's the thing in this league. And, you know, Jamie Storr will tell you that, you know, you, you will have some good years, you'll have some off years. Oakville have been very good every year for a while now. Yeah. Uh, Mike Tarantino, the former coach, did a great job, who's now in Collingwood. But uh, Jamie obviously is going to do a great job too. So in Aurora, you know, we're up and down young. You know, one year we thought we could win the Royal Bank Cup and unfortunately lost to Wellington. Um, but, uh, that was, you know, that was a good year for us, but yeah, so that's my role and, uh, being a hockey geek, I love to be involved, love to go down and watch practice and see my team practice. And it's a lot of fun. Yeah. I love being involved too, but it feels like I haven't been involved since March 5th of 2020. No. <laughs> that's the yeah, last time sad. we were in Brantford, right? Wayne Gretzky sports center at the Oakville yeah. Blades the playoffs. So hopefully we get to the rink soon and I'm going to, follow up with a natural question because you know you are involved with uh highly in, in the league as any talks in this new year so far even though we're about uh a couple weeks in uh seven weeks in uh, seven days in about the return to play for the OJHL is is anything going to happen this year are we just going to scrap it out and and start in September again or still status quo what I'm very pleased about Marty Savoy our, our commissioner is he's, he's not pulling the season he's not pulling the season wow. and he if we got to start the season with only teams in the orange or green zones meaning you know 50 or more he will start the season we will start the season and then for instance york region if we get you know passed and back into the orange zone then we get to start it's similar to what the north is doing and all that but we are not going to pull our season. We will play hockey. And that to me is encouraging um, for all these young guys and all, especially the 20 year olds who are done after this year, it's important that they play. Yeah. So I don't know when we're going to start Nick, but we will start hockey. And that's very encouraging to me. Obviously the previously mentioned was mid January, but currently Ontario's in a lockdown until uh, January 23rd. Now they're thinking of maybe placing a curfew, uh, or extension of lockdown. So let's hope we, we get on the ice soon. If you're saying, hey, we're going to play, let, let's hope that is the case because I know I want to get back to the rink, that's for sure. Um, but uh, obviously it's it's what ifs during this COVID. But that is encouraging to hear. Marty Savoy is fantastic, by the way. I had him on the show two times already, the first multi-time guest on 
on my uh, show here, and he's just great. And I, I do, you know, touching on Marty a little because we're talking about it anyways. He just he, – he runs the league well, but he also respects everyone and every team in it, which sometimes it's hard to come by because there's no favorites being played. He wants everyone to be successful. 100%. You know, uh, the value of the team since we've owned it have, have almost tripled. He's, uh, he's done a masterful job in behind the scenes making 22 teams come together and try to act as one, right? Try to run the same systems. Try, you know, it's like the old McDonald's Burger King. If we, if we have a template that we all run the same system, we'll all benefit. And that's really, since we've been involved in the league, to me, the 22 governors have, you know, they say it's the tightest it's ever been in the history of the league. Wow. And we get into a room and we actually talk. We don't fight. We don't argue. It's like we're all together. And that's encouraging because I was warned when I took over, be, be ready to scrap it out in the governor meetings because you got half the room on one side and half the other. I've yet to be in a governor's meeting where two governors have raised their voices at each other. And that's encouraging. Wow. And the other thing is, is, you know, we're, 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 we're in this together, you know, we're building together and it, it's a lot of fun to sit with a lot of businessmen who are so passionate about hockey, Jamie Storr being one of them, right. And just listening to them talk and their stories. And it's, it's really, really educational. It's in really, it's a lot of fun. Bottom line is it's a lot of fun. And uh, Marty's done a masterful job in bringing the value and, the product level up, and that's a big, big thing. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, moving on personally for you, um, Jim Thompson's dreams. Uh, it's, 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 it's your thing. It's your business, your company. Um, for people who don't know, uh, what is it? What is it about? Uh, what does it entail? So back to Don Cherry. So years ago, my two boys and I were watching an NHL game, and Coach's Corner came on. And Don Cherry said to all the coaches and parents out there who are telling your kid they can't make it, shame on you because kids dream and dreams do come true. So um, I said, wow, that's powerful. So I wrote this, I started drawing and you can't see it, but you know, down here it says dreamer and it's got all my teams from Markham Waxers, the Toronto Marbles of the OHL, all the way up to my NHL team. Yeah. I did, Nick, was I drew up this tattoo and I opened up a company, Jim Thompson's Dreams Do Come True. So what that is, is everything, as you said, on-ice mentoring, off-ice mentoring, life coaching, um, interventions, um, guest speaking. I do a ton of guest speaking, uh, schools, rehab places, wherever whoever wants to listen to my story. And basically what I do is, you know, I, I share my story and my real life tragedies and successes and hope that I can plant a seed in an, in an individual in that room that will help them. And I've been doing it now for uh, 10 years and I love it. My JT prospects has been going on for 21 years. That's uh, the training. And uh, so that's what that whole umbrella is about. And I can say this, um, I'll tell anybody this, the NHL wasn't my calling. Um, the NHL was the foundation for what I'm doing now and saving lives and working with people to change their lives because it's a powerful, powerful thing when I can take, take a human being who's, you know, I'll give you an example. I, I was on the phone for an hour and a half the other night to a 20 year old hockey player who was contemplating suicide and we spoke and we talked and, and it was one of these things where, you know, day by day, but we got this person back into some positive energy, back into believing that there is more than just hockey, more than just, you know, negative things in his life. And that's a powerful, powerful thing when you can, you know, help somebody save their life and what have you. So I, I uh, take it very seriously. I enjoy it. And it is my NHL now is to work with people and, you know, as I said earlier, we do a lot of work down at the homeless shelter and, you know, I take my team down there and we take them clothes and we feed them and, you know, they roar taggers and this isn't about what we're doing, but their fridge broke. Well, they depend on a fridge to have their food down there. So roar taggers went and sponsored them an industrial fridge and it's about what, what else do we have but to give back, 
right? And that's where my motives are and that's where my energy goes is how can I change somebody's life? It's very important. If anybody follows me on Instagram or Twitter, I'm throwing out positive stuff all the time. And not only, you know, somebody direct messaged me and they say, why do you put all this stuff out? I said, first of all, <laughs> if I can inspire one person who's on my feed, then I've done my job. But I said, there's days I wake up that I don't feel well. And, you know, I had eight concussions when I played. I, there's days I get up and I'm in a dark spot. And sometimes just a little positive energy changes my morning and how I get through my day. So it's not only for other people, but it helps me. So positive energy, and especially with the last year coming into March with COVID, we need a lot of positive energy. And we even we even need more watching what happened in the United States yesterday. I mean, we're, you know, 2000, 2021 was supposed to change. We're seven days in into it. And it's like, are you kidding me? So, yeah, you know, different, the topic for a different day, but really sad stuff. Jim, I feel like you're a different person in a fantastic way, trying to help other people um, going through some tough times. I feel like I, not because I'm, I'm talking to you and tooting anyone's horn, but I feel like you have to have gone through something and gone through certain experiences and have the right mindset kind of to help other kids, adults, people in general. And you're, you're, what you're doing is, is fantastic. You probably hear it from a lot of people, but it has to be reiterated, of course. I appreciate it. And I'll say this to you. You have to live it to teach it. So you wouldn't know this about me. I'm the youngest of 10. I grew up in a mobile home. If you watch the trailer park boys, that's basically how we grew up with no money. My dad worked out of town for two weeks, would come home for two days. He was a chef up on the oil rigs. I never had a ride to hockey. I had to depend on a ride every year to hockey. My mom never had a driver's license. She was from England, raised all these kids. So you have to live in the trenches to help anybody you know, and I, 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 my life is, I call it street smart. So I wasn't good in school. I'm not well educated, but I got a ton of education on being at the bottom. And I'm not talking being at the top financially. I'm talking being at the top with peace, with love, with, with, with giving something back to somebody who's in need of happiness, just to, you know, th these are trying times and we need to be nice to each other. Absolutely. And I couldn't agree with you more. The, the kindness goes a long way. I mean, my, my mom, you know, tells me all the time, nice people finish last, but it's important to still be nice and to be yeah. yourself. Right. And it is, yeah. and it is what it is. And you just got to keep on being positive as much as you can and keep on moving forward. We're going to move forward here with the last couple of, couple of items. Uh, being an NHL ambassador, um, you're with, you're, you are that for King Heights Academy in Thornhill. What is that? What, what do you really do? What does that really entail? Is it just kind of showing up and, and doing some things or what is it all about? So Darcy Tucker and I are both the NHL ambassadors at King Heights Academy, which is in Thornhill, a new sports school. They've been actually 10 years, but they moved over to uh, 130 Rackle Parkway. So my job is this. I go on the ice, but my big job there is I work behind the scenes with problems same thing as we're talking about so a young person could be having a tough time there could be a bullying situation there could be whatever it is problems with their parents um, parents problems with their kids so I what I'm good at what I love to do I go in and I help make people happy make people more peaceful so I really enjoy Nick just going in and if there's a young person sitting across from me that's struggling man, to have a, a session with them and watch them get up and feel so much better. And then we, you know, we talk after, how are you doing? Oh, I feel so much better. I mean, it's powerful stuff because I didn't have that when I was a kid. I didn't have somebody like me that I could sit down with that I respected or looked up to that actually cared about how I felt. So I do know how it feels and I do know how it helps. So when you ask me what I do there, I, that's what I do there. And I'm proud of it. I love it. I'm busy. I love going there and working with the teachers, working with Tim Sim, the principal, and Chad Malone. And it's, a, it's just a beautiful thing to help young people. Absolutely. That's, that's amazing. Hey, you've got to help me get Darcy Tucker on my show now. You have to. It's, no. 100%. 100%. No, that's awesome. Um, uh, finally, Jim, the, 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 game of, the game of hockey in, in general, 
um, I guess you can say any level, but even let's say maybe focus a bit on the NHL since you were there, of course. Um, how has the game, in your opinion, uh, changed from uh, when you were playing uh, to now? Well, the first thing is the clutching and the grabbing. <laughs> you know, when you go back, when you go back in the '80s and watch how we could hook a player up the ice, how we could hold a guy's stick, how we could bear hug a guy like it, it's <laughs> almost comical to what we got away with back then. So that's one thing, right? Mm-hmm. The, the, you know, no red line, the, um, the speed of the game, the strength of the athletes, the, the precision of the talent pool, like what they're doing now with the puck and, you know, some of the stuff that goes on on the ice didn't happen back when I played. And, you know, that's technology, better sticks, better equipment, you know, more, more time to practice. So um, just the speed of the game, the strength of the game, um, the game will always be the game, but um, it's, it's, you know, it's almost in a sense, a little dangerous of how fast it is. Like, you know, you gotta, you gotta really, really keep your head up out there when you got, you know, guys going that fast and running into each other. Like it's like car accidents all over the ring. If a guy connects with the guy. So um, yeah, the game has changed in a good way because back to the fighting, we don't need fighting. It's what a fast entertaining like the world juniors, you know, people are sad the county lost. Yeah, we want to win. Yeah. But we should just be blessed that there was 20, sorry, 40 athletes that love the game of hockey that we all inspire to be going out there and played an unbelievable hockey game in a two nothing game in a championship game. Like to me, we should all be blessed, not be cutting the, you know, this guy up or that. Just be happy that, you know, we got to see um, this great tournament go off because you know, it's funny. With COVID and everything, everybody's complaining about the garbage can and all these different things are, you know, it's all part of the entertainment. I'm not saying I agreed with that. I don't agree with it. They shouldn't have done that. Yeah. But the bottom line is, what if the tournament didn't go? What were we doing over the holidays? So take the good out of it. U.S. won. They deserve to win. We'll have our time. We've had our time before. But let's just be happy that 40 athletes got to play in a championship gold medal game and give us a great night of entertainment. Yeah, and I couldn't agree with you more. Um, listen, Jim, you probably hear this a lot, uh, but, you know, you have a fantastic story and you're doing some fantastic things. Uh, and I, I appreciate you uh, you coming on. We reached out very welcoming. And and it, it, does, it does mean a lot to me as a guy trying to come up in the business, even though we're, you know, technically, I guess, a part and a hand in the same league now. But, you know, a lot of former NHLers, no matter what, if you played one game or a thousand games, uh, doesn't give you know people like myself an opportunity to uh, just talk, just chat. Uh, so I do appreciate you coming on, and uh, best of luck with all your stuff moving forward. And uh, hope hope talk soon. I really appreciate it, Nick. And let's hope we see each other. Uh, just last thing, we had a really really tough year last year, but you, I told Jamie Store this. You guys made our season because if you if I looked at the calendar. And said, what's the game? What's the toughest game on the calendar? Would have been in Oakville at the end of the year. And a team that had won six games to come in there and just have the perfect storm made these young guys this season. It was unbelievable because, you know, my assistant coach said to me, he goes, well, you've seen the movie The Miracle, right? He goes, we need the miracle tonight. And I said, I get it. But I'll tell you what, it was a miracle. It was a beautiful way to end the season. We thank you for that as much as it probably peed off Jamie's store, right? But I anyways. remember that game. I called it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it's just it was beautiful. So thank you very much for having me on, and good luck. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again. Absolutely. Um, everyone, Jim Thompson, former NHLer, uh, Jim Thompson's dreams, NHL ambassador, life coach, so much, so much more. Um, on episode number 28 of Mamma Mia, this is Fire Talk. Please follow on social media platforms, myself, and Jim Thompson as well, sending out positive vibes and positive energy as much as possible. On episode 29, I'll be talking to a former OJHLer and a current OHLer, as well as Instagram Lives coming up on the horizon. I'm Nicholas Fuhrer for the Oakville Blades. That's Jim Thompson, former NHLer Thank for you. the Aurora Tigers. Thank you. Happy New Year. And Mamma Mia. Mamma Mia. Now Davis takes it and looks to come the other way. Davis is in, trying to drive. And he will look to go across. Good play to Davis, though, to get it right back to him. He goes down low to Israels. 
Centering, it's there! Scores! Stevie, Stevie, Stevie! Steven Whittle scores his first OJHL playoff goal for the Oakville Blades! This game is opening up in a big way for both teams. Ricketts, centering, what a pass, Israel's breakaway, the move, scores! What a goal for the Alaska Fairbanks commit! The assistant captain, Harrison Israels, with an absolute dandy! Download Alliance, Jack Lyons, centering, scores! The double jacks combine as the, that puck popped up like a jack in a box. And it's Jack Ricketts from Jack Lyons. 6-1 on the 40th shot of the game. It's all over. Well, like Smith hits it in. A chance here can develop, but the Blades will look to take it. And, is, and Ricketts finds Israels. Breakaway, Israels. A chance back in. Rebound. That was Mamma Mia, This Is Fire Talk with Nicholas Fiore. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for the next episode.